This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are a Christ-centered family of God's people, growing in faith, caring for each other, bringing others to Christ, and ministering to the needs of our changing community and world. This morning, I want to talk about uh, us, uh, the human condition, humanity, but first talk about God. But before God, I want to talk about a verb, the verb to be. Uh, and uh, any uh, language that I've studied, we've always early on uh, conjugated and parsed and looked at the form of the verb to be. Uh, first, second, and third uh, person uh, singular is I am, you are, he, she, it is. The verb to be, which means to live, to exist. And uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet begins with a question or has a question, to be or not to be. So the verb to be. And I was thinking about this because I heard someone the other day saying that you are not a human doing, you are a human being. I've heard that uh, expressed for psychology and self-help and also theologically. In part, that means if you're a human doing, you only have worth in what you do. And if you're not doing anything, then all of a sudden you have no worth. But our worth goes much deeper. Doing things is great, especially things for God. God appreciates our effort. But ultimately, our worth, our worth is not in our doing, but in our human being. And I'll speak more to that in a little bit. The scripture I'd like to lift up is from Exodus chapter 3, the first 14 verses. And I'll intersperse a few comments in some of the verses. But here's Moses at the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. I remember when I was 20 years old, I was uh, on the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt with a friend who was Egyptian named Gergis, which means George. And we we're at St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula, oldest monastery in the world, about 1,600 years old. And we were in front of a gigantic bush. And I said to Gergis, is that the burning bush? And he said, yes. So it's believed to be the descendant or the seed or, uh, of the burning bush. Maybe it is, or maybe the bush was somewhere in that vicinity. One day we'll find out. I don't know why it couldn't have been. Uh, we're in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula at the base of Mount Sinai. So, uh, but I remember that very much. The, con the scripture continues. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I'm remembering last sun summer in India, preaching in a very large church in my socks. 99% of the people or more were barefoot because they came to church in their sandals. The handful of us that came in our shoes were in our socks. But that was their expression of the sanctuary being holy ground. God's everywhere, but their, their church was set aside for worshiping God, so they considered it holy ground. And it was a lovely way to remember the importance of God and our reverence for God, uh, taking off one's shoes before entering the sanctuary. 30 years ago, when I first went to India, I preached in a very, very, very poor church. They had no walls. The church had a dirt floor packed down, uh, bamboo poles that came up and a thatch roof above no walls whatsoever so great if it was a, there was a cool breeze and it wasn't too hot out otherwise the congregation suffered but no walls very very poor church but that was the first time where I took my shoes off to enter the sanctuary and all the other people took off their sandals they're very poor their church was very simple more like a picnic shelter, 
uh, but that was their sacred place. The scripture continues. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? In the ancient world, if you knew the name of a God, you knew what one or two things they were in charge of, um, what you could expect from them, and also how to manipulate them. So Moses asked, What is your name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. May God bless this reading of scripture. To be, I am, you are, um, out of the thousand or so names for God in scripture and titles for God and ways we refer to God in our hymns, this is in a sense the primary one. And it's called the Tetragrammaton and, and uh, God's sharing who he is, that, that God is uh, all self-sufficient. He has no beginning and no ending and needs nobody else. God is complete in and of himself. And God is a source and creator of all things. He's not limited by a name. He's the name above all names and is a complete and whole in and of himself. And Jesus Christ, thousands of years later, when he wanted to reveal to the people that he was the Son of God, God in flesh appearing, Jesus said, before Abraham, I am. So Jesus, by saying I am, was identifying himself as God in, incarnate in flesh. And the people responded by gathering stones to stone Jesus, but he escaped at that time. So God gives the name I am, or I am who I am. And uh, many of the Jewish people that are more orthodox or, or uh, religious don't want to say the name of God. And some of my friends in the Holy Land, in an email, they may not spell out even God. They might, instead of G-O-D, they might put G hyphen D. And uh, skip the O as a sign of respect. And instead of saying the name of God, they might refer to God as Hashem, which is uh, a Jewish or Hebrew for the name. So they just call God the name. Or in our scripture, if we see Lord all in capital letters, that would be for I am. Or Adonai means my Lord, or could be for, uh, and a substitution for I am. When we say Yahweh, that is the I am that is referred to first here in Exodus 3. And sometimes Jehovah, that also is another way of saying Yahweh because they couldn't spell Yahweh in the, in the Latin or something. So Jehovah, Yahweh are the same. Adonai or God um, or, or Lord in capital letters would be another way to refer to uh, God as I am. Uh, sometimes words translated as Lord in scripture really literally mean he is that God is. Uh, I am, he is. So the name of God 
is so large, meaning life and to exist, that it encompasses everything. And so there's no pinning God down in something and controlling God. God is the Almighty, the Creator, the, the Lord of all. Now, typically in a sermon, I talk a little bit about how God is good and God is perfect. God is wonderful. God is great. God is love. And how we're not so good. We have good qualities. It's good when we try to do good. Uh, we're not all bad, but all of us have sinned. And our sin separates us from God's perfection. We sin in rebelling against God. We sin in uh, failing to do the good that we can. And we sin when our motives are not pure and our intentions are not perfect. So we need a, we need a Redeemer or a Savior. And that's why Jesus came into the world, to pay the price for our sins and to save us from ourselves, to give us new life on earth and eternal life in heaven. And how is it that we fell? It all started in the garden with our first parents. Adam means the man. And Ha'adam and our first parents had to eat the forbidden fruit. They had all the other fruit available to them. They wanted the forbidden fruit, in essence, to replace God. And it didn't work out so well. And things have been bad ever since. So we need to be reminded that we are not the center of the universe. God is. We are not to be worshipped. God is. We are ultimately not in charge or to be obeyed. God is. We have areas of authority and responsibility, but ultimately we look to God. And the human being needs to remember that because the, the seed of our sin is to want to replace God in rebellion and be our own God, do our own thing, have our own way. And we need to always remember that we're not at the center, God is. And uh, we need to remember that we cannot tip the balance scales on our own to forgiveness. We need a Redeemer, Savior, and Christ. Yet, I want to say something else this morning. About we're not human doings. Our worth is not in what we do, as important as it is. Um, we're human beings. Look at God. This vast universe is so big, there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on our seashores. And yet God seems very focused and fixated on the third rock from the sun. And our sun is just a mediocre star. It's not the biggest or the hottest or the brightest. It's just a regular star. But somehow God in all of this universe seems focused on this world. And after all, who did God walk with in the cool of the day, in the morning and the evening? The first human beings. Who did God breathe life into? The first human beings in every one sense. Who did God let name all the animals? That would be fun. In Genesis 2, I believe. The first human being. Who did God give dominion to over the earth? The animals and the, 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 the plants and the resources. The human being. Who was created in the image of God? We were, male and female, in the image of God, the human beings. And who was fearfully and wonderfully made? We were. And whose cries did God hear out of Egypt? The children of God, the Israelites, and lifted up Moses as a deliverer. Jesus said, God so loved the world. This does not mean that God loved the trees and the rocks and the plants and the animals as lovely as they all are. By the world, he meant the human beings that reside on the earth. Who did God send his son to? Who, why was God's son born in the dirt? And for whom did his son patiently show about love and serving and forgiving? For human beings. And who did Jesus die for? For human beings. And he didn't stay dead. He rose again for through him for us to have new life and forgiveness. And he sent a comforter. To who? The human beings, the Spirit of God to comfort us, to guide us, to give us strength and direction. And God is patient with us. Sometimes God's delay in acting is not because God is not doing anything, but in 2 Peter 3, 9, God's patience was because he wants for all to repent and come to him. God gives us more time to come to ourselves, to stop our bad behaviors and turn to the Lord. So basically, God won't leave us alone. In a sense, God is stalking us. 
God's stalking after us. We need a restraining order to keep God away. And the restraining order of the world was the cross. We'll get rid of God, but God never gives up. As I said, Jesus rose again from the dead and kept coming after us and sends us to the ends of the earth, north, south, east, and west, to reach out to his people. There's a poem, an old poem, The Hound of Heaven, that God pursues us all of life because he loves us and he wants us with him forever, for eternity. I was thinking, in, as we near to closing, one of our members uh, I was hiking with from the church is a physician, and he was telling me about holding a one and a half pound baby who was not well and sticking a needle through the skull to withdraw fluid uh, off of the brain. And I said, what's the likelihood of that baby living? And he said, there's a good chance the baby will live, although it will have many, many, many health problems. Now in the ancient world, a one and a half pound baby with the swelling in the brain, that's a throwaway. That's a curse. But my friend used all of his medical skills because that one and a half pound piece of flesh is a human being. Our daughter in college for a time volunteered in a center where there are children that were severely disabled of mind and body. And she would hold a little baby who had no, who was blind and could not speak and could not taste, could not feel, was practically more than a vegetable with very little brain matter. But our daughter would hold her and paint her fingernails and toenails because that is a human being. Our church has given away more than 2,000 wheelchairs at a time when those gifts were matched and doubled to 4,000 plus to people we'll never meet, we'll never see, can't return the favor, but that's because a human being should not drag along in the dirt. We've served over a quarter million meals at church, uh, nutritious hot meals with warmth and friendliness because human beings should not be hungry. Human beings have worth. Think of a baby. A baby comes into the home and uh, they cry. Most of their cries are complaining, uh, complaints they eat, and they soil their diapers. They don't make an income to help the family. They don't bring uh, honor to the family. They bring expense and a lot of work, and they wake us up. But most people love a baby. Baby hasn't done anything of worth, but a baby is loved. It's a creation created out of love and has value because it is a human being. My point being, yes, God is a sinner. We are not. Uh, and we are fallen. We are sinful. We need our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But our worth is not because of what we have done. As much as God wants us to do things and God honors our efforts and is delighted by everything we do that's good. Our good works are fruit of our faith and bear witness to our love for God and obedience to God. But we can never do enough to earn salvation or be worthy of God. It just so happens that God created us fearfully and wonderfully out of love in God's image, and God's love never lets us go. He loves us so much he sent his son while we were yet sinners, and he pursues us and pursues us and patiently pursues us and delays some activities in the hopes that we'll turn to God because everyone has worth as a human being. When I think of others in this way, it helps me to be more patient and understanding if they're at their worst or having a bad day, because I realize that if they come to know and accept the love of God, they can do great things, but they have worth because they were created, a human being that God wants to be in fellowship with. And everyone who accepts that um, offer has that great joy in this life and the life to come. So we patiently minister to others, reach out to them, forgive them, pray for them, hope for their best, and hope to bring out the best in them. Because even at my worst day, your worst day, anyone's worst day, that's a human being, precious in the sight of God, and one for whom Christ died. Amen, and God bless you.